Okay, let's talk about extubation. It's a huge step in a patient's recovery, but a successful outcome isn't luck. It's a planned, systematic process. We're going to walk through a checklist to help make that process as safe and successful as possible. And the stakes are definitely high. If extubation is timed poorly, it can lead to respiratory failure, which means re-intubation. And as you know, that really increases morbidity and complicates recovery. So that brings us to the most important question. Is your patient really ready? Let's go through the objective criteria you need to answer that question with confidence. Here's how we'll break it down. We'll start with why single metrics aren't enough. Then, we'll cover patient readiness prerequisites, assess respiratory mechanics, evaluate airway protection, and finally, discuss the last tests and overall judgment. First up, let's look at the patient readiness prerequisites. Think of these as the absolute must-haves before you even start to consider extubation. There are really three core pillars here. Number one, the original reason for intubation has to be reversed, or at least significantly better. Number two, the patient needs to be hemodynamically stable. And third, they have to be neurologically ready. So what does hemodynamic stability look like? It means the patient is on minimal or ideally no vasopressor support. You also want to see no active arrhythmias or signs of myocardial ischemia. Any instability can quickly lead to problems once they're breathing on their own. Now for neurological readiness. A Glasgow Coma Scale of eight or more is a common starting point, but it's not enough by itself. The functional assessment is what really matters. Can the patient follow simple commands? And most importantly, can they generate a real cough to protect their own airway? All right, next section. We're moving on to assessing respiratory mechanics. This is where we look at the hard numbers for pulmonary function and gas exchange. This table lays out the key parameters. We're looking for things like a respiratory rate under 30 and an oxygen saturation of at least 92% on 40% FiO2 or less. A couple of key predictors here are the RSBI, the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, which should be less than 105, and the NIF, or Negative Inspiratory Force. You want that to be more than negative 20 centimeters of water as it shows good muscle strength. Okay, so their respiratory mechanics look good. Now we have to evaluate their ability to protect their airway. Can they keep it clear after the tube comes out? And this is a big one. The ability to give a strong, effective cough is a major predictor of success. A weak cough is a serious red flag because it suggests they won't be able to clear secretions. The secretions themselves also tell the story. Manageable secretions are typically thin, clear, and only require infrequent suctioning. On the flip side, if you're dealing with thick, purulent secretions that need frequent suctioning, that's a high-risk situation. The cuff leak test is our tool for checking for airway edema. Qualitatively, you can just deflate the cuff and listen for an audible leak. Quantitatively, you're looking for a leak volume of at least 110 milliliters. If there's little to no leak, that's a sign of significant swelling around the tube. We're almost there. Now it's time for the final procedural checks, right before you make the call to extubate. The Spontaneous Breathing Trial, or SBT, is the gold standard here. You let the patient breathe with minimal support for anywhere from 30 to 120 minutes. Throughout the trial, you're watching them like a hawk for any signs of failure, like respiratory distress or O2 desaturation. Passing this test is a very strong sign they're ready. Last but not least, do a final check on their metabolic status. Make sure their acid-base balance is stable, any major electrolyte issues have been corrected, and they aren't significantly fluid overloaded. All these things can affect respiratory muscle function. So after you've looked at all the data, the decision really boils down to this one question of clinical judgment. If I walk away from this bedside, can this patient protect their airway? If you can't give a confident yes to that, it's not time. So to sum it all up, a safe extubation is based on a comprehensive assessment. You're combining everything their neurostatus, cardiovascular stability, respiratory numbers, how they handle secretions, and whether they can protect their own airway and pass an SBT. The whole point is to make this kind of thorough check a routine part of your daily practice. So the final question is for you to consider. Is your extubation checklist complete? Using a systematic approach like this one is your best bet for ensuring patient safety and a successful outcome.